Okay, everybody, here we go. Is it working? Yes. All right. <laughs> fix my ponytail so I look cute, right? All right, kind of. Yes. It's right behind you. Guys, y'all are ruining her video. Okay. <laughs> I'll start it after. All right, here we go, guys. We're introducing the first unit, unit one. We'll have a total of six units for the, for the year. Uh, the units are divided sometimes into five week periods. So, some, so like for the third one, it'll run over, right? This unit we're talking about is persecution. And how does persecution motivate change? Can anybody tell me what persecution is? Mm -hmm. Good try, good try. Anybody else? Doing a whole, a whole lot of hateful stuff on somebody. Yeah. Or like a group or something. Anybody else got one? Yep, and that's good. We like big words. So persecution can be about a lot of things, right? It can be about uh, not treating someone the same because of their religion or their political beliefs or their race or their ethnicity, or their sex. Persecution can come in many, many different flavors, as we'd like to say. And it's been around for a long, long time. I think in general, humans in general, I think that we're just inherently evil. I don't know if it's something we were taught, but uh, I'm, since I'm a you know, believer, I believe we were just born with it. You know how like uh, an animal is born with the instinct to survive, yeah. right? We're, we're not born with that instinct. We have to learn that instinct. So persecution is something that is taught. It is taught from the parent to the child, and it just keeps going. It is up to us, that's right, to stop and break the cycle. Okay, I'm a very uh, diverse person, even though I'm Republican and right-wing and all that junk. I'm a, I'm a debate coach. I'm supposed to teach both sides. So I'm very, very open-minded about other people's viewpoints, and we want that in the world, don't we? We want that kind of a world where everybody listens to everybody and communicates instead of insulting each other all the time. And unfortunately, in today's world, we don't necessarily have that, do we? No. Right now, it seems to be at the height, like, like we're almost going back to the 1960s, where there were riots in the street and everybody was just hurting everybody. We're almost there again. So as, uh, as students and as adults, we need to take a moment, right, to think where do we stand in all that? What role are we playing, right? in today's world where there's this much persecution. Something to think about. If you don't learn anything more from me this year, when you walk away, when you walk out of here, the one thing I want you to learn is to, to, the communication is everything. You can control the world with the right way of communicating. You can. You can make good things happen or you can make bad things happen. Just like our two major examples, right? During World War II, what's our most famous uh, person that, that used, used rhetoric for the bad? Who was it? Hitler. It was Hitler, yeah. We use him a lot because he was an extremely powerful speaker. He had control over the masses because of the way he was speaking. Okay, It wasn't what he was saying so much, it was how he was doing it. Did those people think he was the greatest thing on earth? Yes. They did, but he, he wasn't. Right. One thing I can tell you about today's world is right now, even by your teachers without them thinking of it, and on TV, when you turn on the TV or when you listen to a song or when you turn on the radio, you are being manipulated. True. Everything you hear on TV, the radio, and from your buddies is rhetoric. If you understand how rhetoric works, then you can control it. You can control your intake filter. I used to watch only CNN. Seriously, that's all I watched. It was the, the biggest news source. I thought everything was coming through all right. After the election, I turned it off and I never turned it back on again because I didn't believe anything they had to say anymore. I only watch Fox now, even though I know in the back of my head some of the things they're saying are manipulative. Okay, I know this in my head. I know not to trust every word. I know this because I'm a debate coach. But at least I can get a viewpoint, and then maybe I can read a couple more articles and then develop my own viewpoint. It is your job now to change the way you intake the rhetoric that starts persecution. Okay? If you learn to control your intake, then you will be a much more educated and intelligent person. You'll be able to have conversations without calling someone a name or arguing with their points of view. Everybody's allowed to have their right, their points of view. Everybody. 
whatever the subject is. The, toy, the thing is, if you talk about it, what, what happens? You solve the problem, right? Can we solve the problem if we discuss things? Isn't it better for us to stop complaining about what we don't agree on and then start looking about what we do agree on? Then you make things happen. So our research study for the nine weeks is how does persecution motivate change? Motivate means to get you to want to do something. So because I was persecuted, what resulted as a, as a result of that? Okay, What did I do because I was persecuted? Our unit objective, students understand that the formation of the colonies then and the global issues now are often driven by groups of people fighting against or escaping governmental and religious persecution. Okay? What was significant about the formation of the colonies? This is where we begin our studies. Really, we used to start out with the, with the Indians. Were the Indians persecuted? <coughs> yes, they were. I didn't know until I was 25 years old. I'm adopted. I met my mother when I was 26, 25, 26. I didn't even know until I was 25 that I'm half Indian. I didn't even know that. Half. I'm half Indian. Because my, my father was a apparently full-blooded Choctaw Indian. My mother was very fair-skinned, and he was light-skinned as well. So uh, it's weird. But because of the fact that I, I learned about that, I'm more in tune with learning about my heritage. And I'm trying to learn more about what the Indians went through. Okay. We, study, we used to study their creationists and, and their, their speeches because you kind of got an idea of what it was like to, uh, to be in a plot of land all your life and then be murdered and kicked off of it, okay, with no say in the matter. So we did that because we started, it started with the, the Protestant Re Reformation over in England. We came here because we were escaping persecution as well. Let's talk about that. Many people coming to the New World were fleeing from religious persecution, giving up their lives, their property, and even family members in order to live freely. Sometimes they left their children behind because they weren't allowed to take them because it was a perilous journey. They had to give up everything. They only brought their bare necessities, and they were on that boat for about three months. Okay? Half of them died as soon as, you know, as, soon as they got through the first month due to disease. Okay? They believed the church was so corrupt that they could trust it for they could no longer trust it for their salvation. Basically, the papacy at the time, and it's changed a lot and it's gotten a lot better, but at the time, there's a lot of corruption. You had to pay your way into heaven. So during that time, it was very difficult for, for everybody. You had to have money in order to go to church, pretty much. So the Protestants who didn't have money, the, the Puritans, the, the, the peasants that didn't have the money, those are the ones that could not go to church could not pay their way and could not, quote, get into heaven. So those fleeing from England survived the Protestant Reformation. It was a bloody rebellion, okay? It was bloody because what had happened was Martin Luther King posted a 99 thesis on the front of the church door. He said, I've had enough, and this is what we think, okay? And he puts it right on the Roman Catholic Church door. That's a big deal because the Roman Catholic Church was completely in charge, right? They made all the rules, everything meshed with the government. They, they had complete control, okay? So to put that defiant 99 thesis right in the front door was very bold. And a lot of people started to see it, and they started to sign on to it, okay? And then they broke away from the church. So when they broke away from the Roman Catholic Church, two groups remained, Catholics who no longer follow the Roman Catholic doctrine, and Protestants. Yes? Uh, yes, go ahead. Those that followed him, uh, those that followed this, uh, later there was a man named John Calvin. John Calvin was the one that led the movement later, okay? It, it eventually got passed on to John Calvin after, after the general, Str 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 Stromwell was his name, William Stromwell. And then Cal the Calvinists is what they became, okay? Because they followed the John Calvin doctrine, which was a, an idea that pre uh, predestination. Does anybody know what predestination is? It's the idea, yes, Jaden, is the idea that you, quote, quote, are already chosen to go to heaven or hell before you're even born. Predestination. Yes. That was only one out of five different things they believed. Total depravity was another one. Uh, and they believed in not, you can't be completely washed of all your sins. You're either black or you're white. Does that make sense? 
And they used a lot of the black and white back then because of slavery. And you'll see when we read the Salem Witch Trials, Tatuba, there's a lot of references to being black in there. Because, of course, back then, they thought black was bad, right? Ooh, white was good. But that's not how it worked. So those are the references you hear in the Crucible and the Salem Witch Trials. Isn't it amazing how far we've come? Thank God. Thank God I wouldn't want to live in that time frame or live in that world. So, some members of the Catholic Church broke away from the Greek Orthodox Church and formed a new group which followed Calvin, known as the Puritans, who later fled to the New World, where one group remained Catholic and the other broke away from tradition and became Protestants. The Catholics uh, started their own factions. One became Quakers, and they, they settled in the northwestern area, northeastern area, and then the Protestants settled in the New England and the, and the uh, east Okay, because remember the 13 colonies were just on the right hand side and up north it took a while for them to expand to the west let's go ahead and take a look at this quick three minute video about the Protestant Reformation just to give you an idea of how it all began with Henry VIII okay? and of course you can watch these lovely little ads before you get to watch it If you want to buy art from an obscure website in China, and then pay your roommate back for the low main from Chinatown, PayPal can do that. PayPal lets you pay friends back fast, <laughs> so you can all trip in for gas and start your road trip off right. church official named Thomas Cranmer. In 1533, King Henry learns his mistress Anne Boleyn is pregnant. So Cranmer, without the blessing of the Pope, secretly marries her. The following year, the English Parliament passes the so-called Act of Supremacy, which says that the true head of the Church of England is the King, not the Pope. Catholicism is banned. Protestant faith takes its place. In the 1500s, the Protestant Revolution is sweeping through Europe. A convergence of forces fans the flames of change. In England, power will shift back and forth between Protestant and Catholic rulers in sometimes bloody conflict. Queen Mary comes to power in 1553 after her Protestant half-brother Edward dies. This daughter of King Henry VIII is, unlike her father, a devout Catholic. Queen Mary, or Bloody Mary, as she became known, starts one of the most violent purges of Protestants in history. Bloody Mary dies in 1558. Her half-sister, Elizabeth, ascends to the throne. One of the first things she has to decide is what England's religion will be. See, given the odds and options of that period, she came through pretty well. Elizabeth returns the Church of England to Protestant hands. So can you imagine uh, believing a certain way, and then all your life you're, you've been told to believe that way, and all of a sudden, oh, we can't believe that anymore because the, church, the king says we have to believe something else. Well, it happened a lot of times. It went back and forth between Catholicism and Protestantism on a regular basis. It was when it landed on the Catholic Church again that caused the, the rebels or the, the rebellion to happen. The Protestants left and then moved to England because it was finally on its last leg that it would be Catholicism. Okay? Okay, y'all need to wake up. <clears throat> so, modern day persecution. Have y'all heard the term, it's just a witch hunt? Okay. 
You've heard that on TV. Trump has said it several times because he felt like uh, he was being zeroed in on something that he didn't do. That's what he was saying, okay? Whether he did it or not is irrelevant. But the term witch hunt is used a lot over history. When someone says it's nothing but a witch hunt, what they're really saying is you're accusing me of something I didn't do without any proof. That's what that really means. This happened at least twice before in history. It was called the Red Scare. We've had two of them, Red Scare 1 and Red Scare 2. We're actually having one right now in politics. Everybody's scared to death of the Russians because of all the media rhetoric. That's another Red Scare, okay? It's another, they're not even communists anymore. We're still scared of them, okay? Red Scare is a term that was used because everybody was frightened during the time of communism, okay? I don't know if anybody knows anything about government, but the three types, there's, there's actually more. <clears throat> the total totalitarian kind is when it's a, either a military dictator or someone in charge has complete control. In North Korea, we have communism, but we also have total totalitarian, total, total, I can't say it, totalitarian, totalitarian, I can't say it. <clears throat> but then we have dictators who are completely in control without any, any religion at all or anything. And then you have what's called socialism. How's Venezuela doing right now, guys? Okay, that's, that's, that's socialism at its best. It's working great for a while, and then all of a sudden now everybody's starving to death. Socialism is when you take Dre's paycheck. Okay, I'm going to take your paycheck. Give me. All right, these people over here, they can't eat, so I'm going to take your paycheck and give you a little bit back, and then I'm going to give the rest to everybody else who doesn't have any money. That's what socialism is. Okay? It's a redistribution of wealth and resources. Okay, so people like Bernie Sanders, for instance, that's what he's kind of preaching. He doesn't say it because it's not popular, but that's what it is. He wants to make sure everybody goes to college, and that's great. But who pays for it? Everybody. Dre does. Right? I'm going to take all your paychecks and redistribute it so everybody else can go to college. If you worked really hard in a job all day, and you had to give that paycheck to somebody else so they could go to college, you'd be a little bit irritated. I want to get it. So this is where our differences start to fall, okay? in politics. Then you have the democratic forum. We have a system set up where there are three separate branches that check each other to make sure every one of them is being, doing right. Okay? If Congress is not performing the functions correctly, then the judges can come say, uh, that's legal. Right? If the president is not performing or doing what he's supposed to be doing, we have the legislative and judicial branch that overrules that sometimes. They all can overrule each other. Okay? It just depends on how it's done. But it's designed to keep our freedom, to keep those basic freedoms protected that we originally had. So with the Red Scare, uh, basically we've learned that history has shown that the persecution continued through various times in history. Okay, and it's still going on now. And it's caused laws and rules to change over time as a result of what we endured, what we went through. Okay? Um, the African American was persecuted during the time of slavery. We learned from that. We're still learning. It was abolished because it was considered not even, not human, right? So we've learned from mistakes, but we're still creating and making some of the new ones over and over again. Some examples of some bad and good. <clears throat> Salem witch trials in the 1600s, and you can fill these in if you see them on your notes. Uh, Salem witch trials in the 1600s and McCarthyism, that's what it's called in the 1940s, which resulted in the Red Scare. There's a man named Senator McCarthy who uh, instigated uh, a bill in Congress, and you're going to learn about that. And he put everybody that he thought was communist on a blacklist, and they were unable to get jobs or work in, in, the, in the entertainment industry. They were able to hold, uh, unable to hold office, and they were watched on a regular basis. And I don't know about you, but if someone did that to me, I'd be a little nervous, right? So that's what the first Red Scare was about. Let's go ahead and <clears throat> take a look at this quick video about the Red Scare to give you an idea about what that was about. The Salem Witch Trials, 1692 to 1693. In Salem Village, Massachusetts, February 1692, Betty Paris, age 9, and Abigail Williams, age 11, the daughter and niece of Reverend Samuel Paris, became ill. 
their health failed to improve as they went into constant fits. So a doctor called William Grace was called in. His diagnosis? Bewitchment. Soon other young women began to exhibit similar behavior, and a wave of hysteria spread throughout colonial Massachusetts. So, a special court assembles in Salem to hear the cases and find people guilty of witchcraft. Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and Tituba were the first people to be accused and arrested of bewitching Betty Harris and Abigail Williams. Every week, more and more were accused and arrested. A belief and fear of the supernatural is the idea that some humans, witches, were given power to harm others through it. A recent smallpox epidemic and the threat of attack by Native American tribes all fueled the hysteria in the Salem community. The first convicted witch, Bridget Bishop, was described as wearing black clothing and odd costumes, which was against the strict Puritan code of Salem. She was hanged on June 10, 1692, at Gallows Hill. Eighteen more people were executed by hanging after being convicted of being a witch. Several others died in prison, and one man was even crushed to death by heavy stones as a form of torture. Contrary to popular belief, none of the condemned were burned at the stake. 150 more people would be accused of witchcraft, but by September 1692, the hysteria had died down as people started to turn against the trials, with the last one ending in early 1693. Subscribe so, to see more history videos. Okay, so this just gives you an idea of the different, of the different types of persecution that were suffered through time. Guys, the main reason why we're looking at this is because we're going to be looking at the comparison of the Salem Witch Trials and McCarthyism, okay? And persecution itself. We're going to be studying this all the whole time. Here's some timeline events. I don't expect you to, to know all these. This is just to give you an idea. You can fill them in on your notes. In May 17th, 1938, the Dyes Committee, that's what it was called, later known as the House of Un-American Activities Committee, is formed to investigate subversive activities within the United States. They were worried about Russia. But it wasn't Russia back then, it was the Soviet Union. Growing up and being in the Army when I served in the, in the Army, it was the Soviet Union at the time. Okay? June 28, 1940, um, Congress passes the Smith Act, which makes it illegal to assist any groups who teach, advocate, or encourage the overthrow or destruction of the government of the United States by force or violence. Does this violate the First Amendment now? This would, wouldn't it? because you're going against freedom of speech, okay? June 28th, 1940, the Smith Act, and then in that February 4th, 1945, Franklin Roosevelt, Winston Churchill, and Joseph Stalin meet in the Soviet resort town of Yalta to make plans for the post-war era, war era. April 20th, 12th, 1945, Roosevelt dies. March 5th, 1946, former British Prime Minister Winston Churchill delivers his famous Iron Curtain speech at a college in Missouri. Czech group coup established a communist government. I was actually in Czechoslovakia before it had the change of government. Okay? It used to just be called Czechoslovakia. Now it's broken up. Okay? Uh, now it's called the Czech Republic. It was just Czechoslovakia when I went there. A Czech coup is, is, is established as a communist government, and then President Truman requests additional funds from Congress to combat communist insurgents. It was fine until we got to about right here. Okay? because the Congress decided to use it for different purposes, okay? This will be posted in Google, so you can look at it later if you didn't get the notes. It's okay if you didn't get them. This is all up on the Google Classroom. Timeline. President Harry S. Truman issues the Executive Order 9335, establishing a loyalty security program for all federal employment employees. Okay, we're okay right now. But then Congress passes the Taft-Hartley Labor Management Relations Act over President Truman's veto sharply curtailing the rights of organized labor while forcing unions to purge communists from their ranks. Okay, now they're saying, all of you truck drivers that have that union, if you know of any communists, we want you to kick them out. Is that, is that pretty much calling the kettle black before you even look at it? All right? And then we have screenwriter John Howard Lawson becomes a hostile witness before the House out of Un-American Activities, refusing to answer, and on constitutional grounds, whether he is a member of the Communist Party. Is this something that we ask our, our citizens today? If they're a member of the Communist Party, do we care? We're not supposed to. Everybody has a right to believe the way they want. 
right? And it's, it's called the Protection of Freedom of Speech. The House of Representatives issues citations for contempt of Congress to the Hollywood 10. Uh, we'll look at that when we get a chance, but there were 10 Hollywood actors that were listed, blacklisted, and then they started spying on them. They wouldn't even let them work, okay? It was horrible. They, took, they seized control of a lot of their funds. They couldn't even live, okay? Members of Hollywood in 1947 are blacklisted from employment, followed by arrests, which led to hysteria and the Red Scare. Hysteria. That's the main thing you need to know. Later hearings by Senator McCarthy became the target of hysteria, and he was later censored for his conduct at the hearings. We'll be looking at this, okay? They basically acted like a jerk, right? And because he acted like a jerk, um, they said, we're not going to listen to you anymore. <laughs> kind of threw that out. What types of persecution exist today? We have, we have a lot going on, don't we? Still. Brutality. Yes. Religious freedom is one of them. That, that is a persecution of, religion, of, of your religion. You have a right yeah. to believe in anything you want. Your religion is yours. doesn't matter what it is. You should have the right. And it's done on both ends, both Islamic and Christianity. It's but done on both ends. Okay? <coughs> freedom of religion in the Constitution, separation of church and state, and rebellions. We're getting all that. Do you see rise in the streets now? People fighting. Uh, I mean, a couple of years ago, we had the church, the awful church killing of that man that went in who said he wanted to be part of the church, and they sat with him through the whole thing, through the Bible study, and then he killed everybody. This is an example of a rebellion or ter terrorism, okay? Gender equality, laws protecting certain rights of citizens, marriage equality, and Supreme Court rulings. This is a type of persecution that's happening today. Hopefully we get it right someday. Political, individuals defect from countries. Communist regimes are toppled, and elections allow individuals to make choices types of persecution and, and speech, media and federal communications law which allow the freedom of speech as new laws being made to protect others. These are more videos we can watch later. Uh, the second scare occurred from 1950 to 1957. This included a campaign to arrest communists and communist sympathizers due to mass hysteria. So this happened like about uh, five to eight years afterwards. Okay. It is often compared to the Salem witch trials because much of the proceedings became a witch hunt, which became out of control and unregulated. So we'll get into this project in a few weeks. We won't be getting into this project right now, but it will be a research collaboration with your group. You'll be sharing Google Slides together, working together, and you'll be trying to answer this question, how does persecution motivate change? You'll be studying what you'll be doing, just to give you an idea is each one will have a presentation, but it'll be a gallery presentation. You'll have it on your desk. We will walk around and look at your presentation at your desk, okay? Major project grade. You'll be working together to answer the question together, okay? The research you'll do together, the evaluation of the sources, or all those things, okay? All right. Okay, you have a few minutes to put everything up.